It is Bronze and Modern Gods. I'm John, and that's Richard. What's going on, buddy? Hey, John. I'm doing good. How are you? I am okay. We've got a lot, as always, on a Monday. It's a packed show. Underrated books of the week. Our uh, main topic, which is our favorite oddball comics. This is going to be a special one. We're going to show you some of the weirder comic books in our personal collections. And we want you to show off yours as well. We'll tell you how later on in the show. But first, a few things. Some housekeeping. Follow us at Facebook and Instagram at Bronze and Modern Gods. Give us a like, subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the notification bell, all that good stuff. You want to show off and support the podcast, we have t-shirts available in the description below or at bronzeandmoderngods.com. But now it is time for our hot book of the week. Richard, what is it? Our hot book of the week is special Marvel edition number 15, the first appearance of Shang-Chi. Boy, that's pretty topical, isn't it? Yeah, I, I guess it's at the height of its market now because of the release of the movie. God, can, I still haven't seen it. I haven't either. We're going to see it with Evan on Thursday. Oh, nice. I, I want a full report afterwards. Yeah. Uh, you know, the first appearance of Shang-Chi came out in 1973. Uh, Special Marvel edition was a reprint title. It was reprinting first. It started reprinting Thor stories, and then it switched to Sergeant Fury stories. Uh, I'm sure sales were just spectacular. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they were going to do an ad adaptation of Kung Fu. And then they realized that DC was chasing it at the same time. So uh, they pivoted. And they came up with Shang-Chi, uh, Master of Kung Fu, instead. And, you know, unfortunately, in retrospect, they tied in the uh, Fu Manchu mythos mm -hmm. to this. So that's caused all sorts of problems, not only, um, you know, uh, not only politically correct uh, problems, but uh, licensing problems as well. Um, for the longest time, they couldn't even reprint these stories, and they worked a few deals out, and that's where you got the omnibus from. But the movie came out this past week. It's doing well. Yeah. And you have a couple of GPA reports that I'm shaking my head. At. <laughs> yeah, this book, this book is really on fire. Uh, the peak GPA for the 90 day was 15,625. The last sale has kind of slowed down a little bit. It's 13,800. But yeah, those are big numbers for, uh, for a book that uh, you said that it's not a tough book to find. No. How many 9.8s are there? There are 109 9.8s. Okay. I can see the 9.8 being tough uh, because of the black cover, but you guys have to remember, this is not a tough book. There was a warehouse find of this book in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, personally, I remember seeing stacks and stacks and stacks of this book uh, at conventions in the early 80s. It was not hard to find. I will caveat that by saying 9.8 might be tough because, you know, it's got that black cover. It's got corner dings. It's got a couple of spine ticks that show up pretty well. You're going to have a 9.6 or a 9.4. So 9.8 may legitimately be a tough book, but if you guys are just wanting a copy to have a copy, be patient. Uh, this is not the time to buy. That is my uh, that is my advice. I'm trying to remember the name of the guy that's on CNBC. That's like hold. Uh, the oh yeah, I, <laughs> Kramer. There you go. I'm doing my <laughs> Kramer. This is a hold. Don't don't buy this right now. No, I totally agree. There are there are a, a lot of copies of this up on eBay right now. the The hockey stick for the 9.8 between 9.6 and 9.6 is going for around. 3,500. So there's a huge gap between the 9.6 and the, and the 9.8. But yeah, if, if you're interested in the book, now's not the time to buy. You can get it on the down low. You know, once the movie's been out for a month, let's say, the prices are going to start to go back down. Then it's a, a better time to buy. Right now, you're, you're buying into the, the hype. You know, if you want uh, to represent uh, Asian superheroes and and, and find a, a really key first appearance that's a little more affordable to show your love for this uh, type of thing, get the first appearance of Amadeus Cho as Brawn in oh, Chan. Yeah. You know, that's that's still a pretty underrated book. Well, not the first Amadeus Cho, but first Amadeus right. Cho is Braun. I think you can probably still find that for cover price. If you're no, thinking. Champions 22 is uh, the, uh, Braun and Ironheart. Ironheart, yeah. yeah. That's that's a tough book to get, but it's a book I would look look for. You know, again, if you're looking for you know representing Asian superheroes, 
there are a lot, other, a lot of other options you can get now that are still affordable and are not $13,000. We're going to say it again. New Agents of Atlas number one. Yeah. Marvel really should hire us for promoting this <laughs> stuff. Yeah, but I agree. that that's that That's a great spec right now. Um, I think we're going to see something with that sooner rather than later. And it's a good read. I mean, it is. Yeah, it's a good story. I believe it or not, we do still read comic books. Yes. Uh, and speaking of which, we still love comic books. I haven't said the initials N, F, or T yet this entire episode because we're here talking about our favorite oddball comic books. These are books in our collection that aren't necessarily worth a lot, but they mean a lot to us personally. And we're going to show them off and get your thoughts because uh, mine are really oddball. I, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not kidding when I say it. No, I, but you're known for your oddball books, though. I am. I'm going to start off with Love Romances, number 83. Now, why am I showing you this book? Because this issue, in particular, began a run of Jack Kirby covers on this title. This was published in 1959, right after Jack returned to Marvel Comics after some time away. Um and not only do you have early Jack Kirby art on the cover of this book, you've got Matt Baker art uh, in two stories inside as well. And as this love romances run continues, you start to have Kirby art on the interiors as well as on the cover to the point where there's a couple of issues that are almost entirely Jack Kirby art. And this is wow. fantastic for number one. This is right around the same time when he's doing a Gratu and It the Colossus and all the monster books. So people just kind of sleep on these romance books. But this book ran to issue number 106 in 1963, right in the heart of the uh, early Marvel age of comics. <laughs> the good news, if you just want to see these books and the art, they were just collected in a trade paperback this year from Marvel entitled, is exactly what it says, the complete Kirby war and romance. It's all the romance stories that he did in the covers for both the war comics in the early uh, 1960s and late 1950s and the romance comics. Now, when it comes to these books in particular, I know there's a few of you out there that chase these as well besides me because competition gets tough when these things go up. They are super tough in grade. No one was collecting these. Um, these were red and thrown away or tossed in quarter boxes or uh, returned to the publisher with the type stripped off of it. So they're very tough and great. So when they do come up, uh, they go for at least 50, 60 bucks in very good or better at least. So that's my first oddball book. That's awesome. People, un people underestimate the power of the romance novels or romance books in uh, comic book uh, history. Well, Simon and Kirby invented the romance comic uh, it, with Young Love and Young Romance number one, and they uh, they kept with it. At least uh, Jack Kirby did to the bitter end. Then what people forget it, there was an audience for romance comics out there because through the seventies and early eighties, Charlton kept romance comics alive by publishing a couple of romance titles. I think the last one, this shows you how much I know about this stupid stuff, Richard. The last <laughs> one was a book called Soap Opera Romance in 1983 from Charlton. I think that was the last wow. romance. Well, comic out. Again, you are a, an encyclopedia of comic book knowledge. Yeah, someone's going to get in the comments and tell me I'm wrong. Go for <laughs> it. All right, what's your next, what's your first uh, oddball book? Uh, my first oddball book is one I've, I've talked about before, uh, Batman the Killing Joke, uh, specifically the Harley Quinn uh, 25th anniversary variant. This is a Mexican variant. It's in, it's in Spanish. The, the primary reason that I recommend or I'm talking about this book is the cover. Uh, anybody who knows the Killing Joke cover, uh, it's very iconic. It's Joker with a camera. And he's fo photographing himself shoot, basically, you know, he shot Barbara uh, Gordon in the, in the stomach and she's now paralyzed. And he takes a picture of it because he's sick and twisted. Um, this particular cover is that, exa that, exa that exact same moment, but instead of it being the Joker taking the picture, it's Harley Quinn. I, I just love the transposition that's that's in that whole um, that whole element because it's it's Harley Quinn. You know the the characters in the Killing Joke are older characters, uh, so it's an older Harley Quinn, and uh, it's just it's just a interesting cover 
for um, for this storyline. This book was released in uh, 2017. Like I said, it's a 25th anniversary. It was published by Editorial Editorial Televisa. Very good. Um, yeah. Uh, Editorial. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, I was doing some research on it. Apparently, uh, there's uh, on Reddit someone mentioned that it's also used in the German version of the Killing Joke, also for the 25th anniversary. The GPA for this book is pretty low. Um, there was a sale last May uh, or this May for $90. Uh, on eBay, you'll find it optimistically at $450 for a 9.8. I, I probably would hold off on paying that for this book. There are only four 9.8s on the census uh, out of 20 books graded total. So, um, yeah, it's they're, they're out there raw. If you want to pick it up raw, uh, I recommend it. It's, I think it's a really fun book to have in your collection. Excellent. Now... I tend to pick things that are really off the beaten path because I've been, I think the reason why is because I've been doing this for so long, <laughs> and I, you know, finding a run of Captain America or Fantastic Four, you know, that's fine, but there's no challenge. You can always find them on eBay. You can always find them at a show. If you really need a copy of Tales of Suspense 98, you're going to find it somewhere. I really like a challenge. And <laughs> so that's why I kind of really go for this weird stuff especially around Marvel, which is my favorite company, and Jack Kirby in particular. No Jack Kirby involved in the next one, but it doesn't get more oddball than Patsy Walker's Fashion Parade Annual Number 1 from 1966. Why do I like this book? Well, it's an early Marvel annual. This was the fourth year that they were doing annuals. They started in 1962. Uh, Patsy Walker was a title that ran from the early days of timely comics in the 40s all the way through the mid-60s. It was really popular. Uh, Patsy Walker was in multiple titles. Uh, it sold, you know, they claimed it sold in the millions and there was a readership in the millions. Really? Now, was this what I've, I've seen you talk about Patsy before? What's the premise of the story? Teenage romance. You know, Patsy was the all American girl. She had a boyfriend, Buzz Baxter. Uh, you know, it's basically a, a, a less wacky Archie in a lot of respects. Okay. It was really more tilted towards the romance portion of it. Uh, Patsy Walker went on to become everyone shouted together with me. The Hellcat. That's true. You're so, right. So there is a there is a superhero tie-in there. Stanley obviously had a heavy hand in this. He was writing most of the stories, a lot of art from Al Hartley, um, some by Dan DiCarlo. Patsy Walker and the Millie the Model annuals show how strong sales still were for these titles. Even in the middle of Marvel superhero boom in the early 1960s, they still sold a lot to girls. Millie the Model and Patsy Walker. This annual and a lot of the Patsy books are extremely tough and great because all of them had paper dolls inside. Oh. Yeah, exactly. You can cut out the paper dolls and the fashions and put them on the dolls. And sometimes you'll find a really sharp copy and you'll buy it without leaping through it. You'll get home and you'll see a big cut out paper doll and you'll bang your head against the wall. Um, this one in particular that I have is really cool because it is like some of the annuals you have, Richard. It's a Canadian variant with oh, okay. the black, the blank back cover and the blank interior covers. And traditionally, it's really weird. Canadian variants, you know, from the 80s are really in demand. People want them. But these Canadian variants from the 60s, these annuals are really looked down upon. Uh, Price-wise compared to the U.S. version, they're not worth more. They're actually worth less. Uh, I so, would think, you know, there, there's an oddity there. You know, there's not, not the standard book. Uh, I think so too, but the market has decided uh, elsewise. Uh, and all that white page to, to be <laughs> molested over the years. It's, it's a tougher book to get in grade. Easier to clean. Uh, but, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> so Patsy Walker, Millie the Models, I, I tend to just pick them up if the cover appeals to me or if it's something priced right. It's not something I'm trying to get a full run of. Uh, the Dan DiCarlo issues, you know, very famous Archie artist. He started on these titles, and then went to Archie. The Dan DiCarlo issues are hundreds and hundreds of dollars when you find them. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's tough to get a run of these because they're pretty scarce. Excellent. What you got next? Mine is the polar opposite of the, <laughs> the title that you just offered up. Uh, it is Luftwaffe 
1946, the technical manual number six. Uh, this is a book that I'm, I am a, a huge fan of history of uh, the second World war military history in general. Uh, but, but specifically the vehicles and equipment from the second world war. And this really just hit, hit my, um, hit, hit my nerve when I first saw this back in, um, in 1998, it was released by Arctic press. Um, a Spanish man named uh, Justo Miranda did the research for this. And it's basically a history of the fictional reality based on the Luftwaffe 1946 comic book series. Is this a comic book? Yeah, it's a comic book. Wow. Uh, it takes the premise that those that the Nazis were not defeated in 1945 and the Second World War continued into 90, 1946. And it gave an opportunity for them to, to launch all of these uh, super weapons that, mm. you know, they were in research uh, in, in our reality, but they never came to fruition because of all kinds of limitations from supplies because the allies were bombing all the factories and they didn't have the raw resources and things like this. Well, in this universe, those, those limitations don't hold. And the, 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 the Germans come up with a variety of super weapons. And this book kind of is a illustrated guide, a kind of a list of blueprints and specs for a variety of planes that are uh, a part of that of that universe, and it's fascinating to see because a lot of this stuff is based on real uh, information that came from um, you know Nazi records from the end of the war. These are things that were in plans, and um, we're we're still on the drawing board. And here in, in in this book, they've actually made it to the frontline combat, so it's, it's really interesting. Um, if you're a fan of, uh, you know, alternate reality like Harry Turtle Dove does, the, the 1946 series is pretty cool in that regard. Again, this is more of kind of an anthology of the of the the weapons used in the series. This is this is my bread and butter. I love this kind of technical detail stuff. Where did you um, find this? I bought it back in the day. Uh, wow. this, was, this is a book that is from my original collection. Um, and you know, this this book specifically, number six. So yeah, it's, 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 it's always been in my collection. I have, I always known where, it, you know, I have a lot of books, but it's one of those books I always know where it is um, because it's just such a cool book. Uh, it's a, it's, you know, this is black and white and, and it's a lot of text because it has a lot of history of these things, but it's a really cool book. Unfortunately, uh, there's really nothing on the census. I don't know how the collectability of this thing, there are no books on the census for this uh, and there are no GPA sales, obviously. So, you know, you could buy this on eBay right now for about $15. It's not an expensive book to buy. But I think if you're interested in the subject, you know, that what if, you know, what if the Second World War continued into 1946 and all of the jet planes that the Germans were threatening to, to, to actually introduce actually came out. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool um, hypothesis to follow and go down that path. That's crazy. I, 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 I know your love of aircraft and, and technical things. So I, I would have predicted that you would like this type of book. I just never would have predicted that it existed. <laughs> <laughs> well, we said oddball books, right? This is you got it. man. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm going to try to one up you. Are you ready? All right. This is win a prize. Number two. <laughs> Win a Prize was a title that ran for two issues, number one and number two, and it was by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. If you look at the really oh, wow Jack Kirby cover uh, with this underwater fish uh, monster kind of thing chasing after this scuba diver who's looking at a big diamond undersea, plus you can win 500 free prizes if you buy this comic book. This book was started by Simon and Kirby. They had their own publishing house called Mainline Publications. And they had their own romance books, their own crime books, and they were fighting American. They were trying to do things uh, on their own. Well, it happened right when Seduction of the Innocent came out and the comic book industry collapsed. Right. So they took all of the uh, unsold inventory, including Win a Prize, number one and two, that never got published, and they sold it to Charlton Comics, who released these two issues the basic premise was not only can you enjoy the stories in the comic book here but there were 500 prizes to be given away to readers you had to buy the book and 
enter to win. And who knows if they actually gave away prizes, if it was all a big scam. <laughs> uh, but hey, Jack Kirby art on the cover and inside. So if you are a Jack completist, you really need copies of Win a Prize number one and two. I found this at a convention maybe 15, 20 years ago. I would say it's a it's a real strong 6.0, maybe a 6.5. It's gorgeous. I'm going to send it eventually someday to get slabbed uh, if, you know, things ever improve in that area. But uh, let me ask you that to win the prize, did you have to fill out a form that's in the comic book? Is it one of those self-destructive kinds of uh, contests? You know what? I need to flip through and make sure. Here's how you can win prizes on the back. Uh, they explain it. It's a lot of text here. But basically, you filled out this form and you sent it in. Luckily, my copy was <laughs> uh, clipped. So I can't imagine if you were buying a book with the whole premise of win a prize, you're going to enter. Right, so right. I feel very fortunate that my copy of win a prize number two is complete. Excellent. What's your last one? My last book is uh, is definitely a weird one. Uh, it is Warcorns, Combat Unicorns for Hire. And this is specifically the Kickstarter foil edition. What is happening? <laughs> uh, this is an interesting book. Um, I found this um, entry on Kickstarter uh, last year. Uh, yeah, a year and a half ago. And uh, it's uh, Garrett Gunn was trying to raise funds to be able to launch this comic, Warcorns. And um, so I put my money in. I actually bought um, a, an extension to it to give me access to other uh, copies. There's a cover by Ryan Kincaid that was uh, available as a reward. So I got that. Basically, the premise of this, of this book is you got this. This is a one shot. You got a comic book that introduces a bunch of characters and they're all unicorns and they all follow the trope of the. You know, you got the strong one, you got the smart one, you got the sneaky one, you know, you got the charismatic one, you know, that, 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 that whole trope. Um, but they're all unicorns and they're, they're fighting, uh, <laughs> they're fighting unicorns. So I, I, I thought it was an interesting, interesting story. Um, apparently other people have too. There are rumors that this, this has been optioned. I went and looked as, you know, as a part of my research, I, I heard it at the time. This is about, about five months ago. I couldn't find anything online in the research I was doing about anything going forward, but there are rumors that this is being, this is going towards uh, a, a TV show. Well, I'll believe it when I see it, but the Kickstarter program was really interesting. Uh, you, I got my books, but you know, as part of the kick, Kickstarter rewards, you also got these challenge coins, these metal coins that were minted that have the characters faces on them. And you got stickers and there were um, prints of the covers that were available and, it's, you know, it's a nice package of stuff that you got along with the comic book. Right now, there are 13 9.8s of this up on uh, Kickstarter. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> up on uh, the, the, uh, the census. Uh, GPA is really low. It's only $71. There's a sale in July for this book. Uh, it's, this, is a, this is a really weird one. The, the, I got to gotta give it to Garrett Gunn, though. Um, I got my books from him. They had, the, they had been all of the three of them had corner dings in the upper corner. I sent him a text message about it. He immediately sent me out without question, another three books. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, Garrett, I props to Garrett. I wish him much success with this. Uh, there are other um, uh, uh, war corn books out there. Uh, apparently it, it, there is an audience for this. Um, there are more than just, um, just these Kickstarter books. So if you're interested in them, they they are available. The story itself, I'm again, it's very formulaic. I, but again, I, I've read books for so long, I I can I can recognize these storylines, um, you know, just 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 from uh, just from an overall glance. So, but I, but I, again, I think if if this becomes some kind of property, this may be a good book to pick up. It's like My Little Pony Extreme. Yes, Extreme. Or and then Poochie went to his home planet. <laughs> again. You know, and you know, the one of the main characters in the book has has basically a mullet, you know. Oh, well, you know, if we're talking extreme, we're talking mullets, we must be talking 1996, <laughs> which means right. time for the 25 year rule. 
Thank you for your help. <laughs> You're welcome. It is noticed and appreciated. <laughs> what is our 25 year rule book this week? It is Action Comics number 717, um, oh, The oh Trial my. of Superman. Look at uh, that cover. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. This... Let's, Let's just take it in for a second. <laughs> For the people on the podcast who do not have it on YouTube right now, you have what, Richard, on this cover? You've got Superman, uh, a wanted poster for Superman. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a horrible brownish cover, and Superman looks like it's like some thug on the cover of this comic. He is, uh, he is rocking that party in the rear, <laughs> business in the front. <laughs> Yes, he is. He is rocking the mullet. Oh, my. Go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted us to, to soak it in for a second. Oh, boy. This is a part of the Trial of Superman, um, a story arc that covers uh, the tribunal kidnapping uh, Superman for the crimes of his one of his ancestors, Kemel, who uh, is, is uh, being accused of exterminating life on Krypton. Uh, in this story... Uh, Superman and his friend Mope escape to this um, city in space. They're trying to clear Mope's name. Storyline really isn't that important. There is a good fight between Superman and Cyborg Superman, uh, who appears on this in the city and dukes it out with with Supes. Um, and at the end, Superman goes back, goes to save uh, Cyborg Superman, and in the process, he gets captured because Cyber, Cyborg Superman is says. I can't believe you came back. You're so stupid. <laughs> and basically he puts handcuffs on Superman. The crappy, okay. the crappy thing is the story does not continue in 718. It goes to Man of Steel number 52. Yeah, that was the period. You guys remember this in the 90s if you were around. The Superman titles were very interconnected. And it wasn't five separate titles. It was all one story. So one week you'd have action comics the next week man of steel the story continued there the next week superman was out and then they were, you know just kind of went around all five titles and you had to get all five titles and they each had a little triangle on the cover that told you which order to read them in oh gosh what a what a what a what a racket on the, on but dc's part this was the only time i've ever read the superman titles was yeah. at 90s when you had john Bogd bogdanovi i believe that's how you say his name on yeah. art you had ron friends drawing a book you had dave michelini writing uh roger stern just really strong stories yeah but not so much the art um and superman with with uh with the mullet not rocking it for me he also has five o'clock shadow he looks like a like a you know, it's Superman. The tide went on. <laughs> this is what he would look like. It's, it's Superman to the extreme. It's Poochie Superman. Yeah. And the funny thing, I mean, so, you know, in, in researching this, I, I reread 717, and then, then that carries, you know, 718. 718 is an interesting story with a character called Demolitia, mm -hmm. who is a Bloodsport ripoff. The cover for 718 even is the Bloodsport cover with her in place of Bloodsport. Um, eh, it, it's, it it did not help in, <laughs> improve my my opinion of this particular part of the run, um, but yeah. This, so that's that's uh, that's it, what I picked for for the twenty five year this week. This was the downslope of what I thought was kind of a second golden age for Superman. Uh, the editorial team was really strong. They they kept everything cohesive, and it was really you know every week it was almost like a cliffhanger. It was really good, and then came the death of Superman in nineteen. Mm -hmm three and then they kept having to try to top it and top it and top it and they couldn't after that point it was just a big sliding scale downward in the quality but man from i think like 1990 to about 1993 this book was on fire and i never say that about superman especially after my comments in the last episode <laughs> yeah that, i mean to me if if you're interested in the that whole story arc of um Trial of Superman by this by 716, 717, and then uh, Man of Steel 52. Um, otherwise, eh. yeah, 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 you know, meh kind of sums up 1996 in a nutshell, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, we're, sure we're almost done with it. We're going to move to 1997 next year. Just wait. You think this is. <laughs>
I'm <laughs> dreading it. I'm kind of dreading it. Strap yourselves in, kids. All right. It is time for our underrated books of the week. I am going to start with probably one of the most depressing, nihilistic, and just outright bummer of a comic book from the Bronze Age. And that is Combat Kelly and His Deadly Dozen Number 9. This was a Bronze Age war book revival of a 1950s Atlas War Comics character named Combat Kelly. Combat Kelly had red hair. He was, you know, he was a fighting ginger and he was a smart ass. And then they brought him back in the 70s and they just completely ripped off the Dirty Dozen movie by putting him with a bunch of convicts or accused uh, soldiers who had a chance to earn their freedom by going on basic suicide missions this ran for a year and a half. Sales were dipping. They had to cancel the book. So with issue nine, what do you think they did, Richard? Oh, my goodness. According to the show notes, <laughs> they basically killed everybody off. It was a bloodbath. <laughs> they get behind enemy lines. They get captured by this Dr. Mengele type uh, experimental Nazi doctor who proceeds to sever the Achilles tendon of his Come back, Kelly's girlfriend, crippling her for life. Each member of the Deadly Dozen gets killed in various ways. Some of them that we were invested in for the whole nine issues of this run even get killed off panel. They don't even have the dignity of being killed on panel. Oh, man. Everyone but Combat Kelly and his crippled girlfriend get killed. And that's the end. Oh, my goodness. That's terrible. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I reread this uh, this week in preparation for this, and I it it's got the comics code seal of approval on the cover, and I'm like, wow, what a different time 1973 was. Uh, this is a depressing, depressing comic book. It is one of the most depressing comic books ever published. I mean, if you guys have read it, hit me in the comments, back me up here. It's not just me. And that I can't believe people don't seek this book out because it's just insane oh man okay now i have to go find it because i need to read this <laughs> it is it's brutal uh, war is hell children war is hell. <laughs> what do you have this week I, my book is another book from the 80s um it's a book called normal man this is uh, a book that stemmed from uh a four-page story in Cerebus number 56 and 57. That's right. It, it's an Aardvark Vanaheim uh, <laughs> book. It's hard to picture Aardvark Vanaheim as being anything else but Cerebus. Well, they did Flaming Carrot early, too. Oh, that's true. They did They yeah. did Flaming Carrot. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a 12-issue 12 12, uh, limited series. Uh, it's a spook on, spoof on comic books in general. The whole premise is there's this planet called Arnold, and there's a a CPA on the planet who, who <laughs> thinks that uh, the planet is about to be destroyed. So he puts his son uh, aboard a spaceship and launches him into space. And after he launches it, he realizes he was mistaken and the planet really isn't going to be destroyed. And his wife in anger kills him. So, All right. Hey, good, good start. <laughs> so uh, the 20 years later, the norm, the character, you don't know his name yet. Uh, he lands on a planet and on this planet, he has no superpowers, but every single other person on the planet has superpowers. Hence so, the name Normal Man. Right. So he's he's special in that he's not special. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's 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 an interesting story. Uh, there are there are a number of characters. Um, he has an arch villain, uh, and um, the the, the storyline is 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 pretty comical. And again, it's a spoof on comic books in general, and uh, it's an interesting read. Uh, I really didn't necessarily get into it back in uh, this time period, but it was always one of those books that was on the periphery of what I was reading. You know, uh, I, I read Cerebus religiously and I picked up Normal Man every now and then along with Cerebus. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's and it kind of shows in the census. Uh, CGC has only three books in the census. So the highest rating is an 8.5. It That automatically makes me want to go hunt Raws. Raws are about three to fifteen dollars. And um, try to find a 9.8, just so I could say I've got the only 9.8 uh, on the census. Since, since there's only three in the census, no been, been no sales or GPA. There's nothing on GPA for this for this book, and I think that's a shame. I think this is a part of the history of the early 80s and um, and the indie market 
And just just the the concept of this book is is I, something I think should be celebrated. You're burying the lead. Written and drawn by Jim Valentino, who went on to be one of the founding fathers of Image. That's right. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're absolutely right. This is where he got his start. This is where uh, Rob Liefeld came to Jim Valentino specifically when he got the idea for Image because he had experience in publishing comics. He knew how to do it because he had done it with Normal Man. So if it wasn't for Normal Man, I think it's fair to say there may never have been an Image Comics. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great uh, legacy to have to, and another reason to pick this up. Yeah, so truly underrated, I think, if you want to get into that. All right, we are going to wrap it up for this week. Aha. And <laughs> we will uh, remind you to follow us at Bronze and Modern Gods on Facebook and Instagram. Visit us at bronzeandmoderngods.com. Buy a t-shirt if you want to support the podcast. And we will see you next time. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Everybody stay safe. Bye, Tinkerballs. Bye, Tinkerballs. <laughs>